Hi, so today we're going to talk about um, the field trip and just kind of some basic stuff to get ready for that. So we're going to be traveling from Manhattan here up to right near the town of Catskill. We'll actually be in a little town called Leeds, um, which is just outside of Catskill. So we'll meet at the, the lab time on Friday, 2 o'clock, um, out front of um, on, Con on Convent Avenue there. Um, we're, and we'll get on the bus with all our stuff. Bus driver will drive us up to um, the field area. You should have your a backpack with stuff you need to do mapping, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, ready to go. Basically, we're going to drop off your sort of overnight stuff, it's like a suitcase or whatever you need. Um, and then the bus, bus driver will drop us off at, the, at an outcrop, which we'll spend an hour or two looking at. So you've got to be ready to go um, with your field gear. So, And then we'll, we will walk back. We'll walk back and forth um, uh, each day. Friday, we'll walk back. Um, Saturday, we'll go back and forth. Same with Sunday. So um, it's about a, maybe about a mile walk from where we're staying to the rocks that we'll be looking at. So what should you have in your backpack? Or what are we going to be doing? Um, so the basic... The basic thing we're trying to do is to make a make our own geologic maps. So the the pr process there is to find find some rocks, um, identify them, so you know uh, where it's this unit or that unit, and we'll talk about this in a minute, um, and then also know where you are, so you can plot yourself on the map. So we're going to have a, a topographic map that you'll be using as your base and then you'll color over that with a, with a different color um, based on which rock unit you're in and you also make a measurement of the strike and the dip of the rocks and, and put this appropriate symbols on your map for those. So one thing that we're going to do really emphasize is that we make we make the maps as on the fly as we're when we're in the field. So we're, you, you do the coloring, you make the strike and dip measurement when you're there looking at the rock. There's a temptation to, to want to just write some notes and then do it when you get back to the cabin or after the field trip, but that is not um, good, good practice. So inevitably when you're, when, you're, when you're drawing that stuff, you'll realize, oh, I, I, something doesn't seem quite right, but you're not there anymore, so you can't you can't check it, okay. And then one other one other thing. So between the map map units, um, you'll draw a, sol a a line. It'll either be a solid line if you're sure. Oh, this is really. I'm sure this is the boundary between this and that. And if it's uh, not so sure, then you'll dash it. And then you'll go on. You'll go on to the next next rocks, and, and continue to do this process. So we'll talk about this more in the field, but this is kind of the basic outline. So you're going to start with something like this. So this is a this is an example. This is a topographic map from an area that I mapped when I was an, uh, a student myself in Arizona. This was a very small area. One inch was 20 feet, and there were cacti. You can see the three-armed cacti, the dead cacti um, that were we could use to 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 orient ourselves. So using taking a like a bearing on one of these cacti, um, we could figure out oh, where we are on this um, on the map. We'll practice this as well. Um, and then this is what it look. This is what the map looked like at the end of the of the field trip. So we found okay. There's several different units. The colors are different units. Um, we had. You know, we just actually call them by their colors. So, so there's a, a black unit. It's like a darker, darker rock that is shown here in light blue. And then we saw it again over here. 
a lot of time geologic maps have a you know have areas that that are, where you're not sure really what's underneath them so these are often colored yellow and we may or may not decide to do use this this um convention or not um so areas where you're not really sure what's there were colored yellow. Um, there was another unit, uh, a tan colored unit that had a really distinct, big in pink here, showing this like distinct layering that came through and then was covered, and then it came out again. And you can also see on here little strike and dip symbols. And then we made a, a cross section, which I'm not showing here. Um, there was also a a normal fault plotted here with with some strike slip motion, and an overturned um, fold as well. Okay, so we're going to try to make something like this from for this area up in Leeds. So what you what are you going to need to do this? For, so one, so I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll pass out uh, the, the topo map and some mylar sheets. So it's sort of a plastic sheet. This will partly, if you, if you have to do a fair amount of erasing and the, the mylar is tough, so you can erase it over and over again. It's only really going to work if you have erasable colored pencils. And specifically this brand, this Call Erase brand, uh, works really well on the mylar. Other kinds that people have tried don't really, they, you can't really mark the mylar very well. So make sure you've got this, this kind. Um, you'll need your protractor. You'll need some kind of map board, some kind of hard surface to, to, to attach your map to. This could be as simple as a clipboard, although if it rains, which is definitely possible, um, it's good to have some kind of, some kind of cover um, to keep the rain off of it. Um, so you can you can probably get away with some with kind of an ordinary clipboard and some kind of plastic sheet or something. Um, keep an eye on the weather forecast though in case it looks like rain um, we'll need to be, be you'll need to be a little bit more prepared with that. So in your backpack, you're going to want some, you know, basic clothes um, to keep um, sort of protected from the elements. So if it's sunny or cold or rainy, definitely need a water bottle. Probably some lunch. Although you can stop, there's a there's a convenience store that has some food that's about mm, ten minutes away from where we're mapping. So you can go there for lunch as well. So these are the things that you need in your backpack um, I should add to this also you need a you need a pencil and a notebook or some kind of you definitely need a pencil to work on your map and it's also good to have some kind of notebook or some other kind of paper to keep track of things that you keep track of your notes okay so let's look at the, the rock units that you're going to encounter. So one of them is called the Kalkberg. So this is a Devonian. So the D here is indicating the um, Devonian age. So all the rocks that we see are going to have um, are, are Paleozoic rocks. So they have, they have fossils, a lot of them. Um, DK is the initial for the Devonian Kalkberg formation. Kalkberg has is fossiliferous, so it's got a lot of fossils. Um, there's some examples of the fossils you'll that you find in it here. We're not going to really. Um, there's only one one unit where we're really going to kind of pay attention to the, you know, very distinctive fossil that helps us identify it. Um, but paleontologists would be much more familiar with fossils and use use that information to help identify this rock. Um, it says it's an argillaceous lime, wacky stone, and pack stone. So I realize that we haven't talked about um, 
uh, carbonate rocks, and you probably don't know this this stuff from from earlier classes either. So I'll explain what these mean in a minute. Um, the lower portion of this unit contains about a half dozen several centimeter thick continuous layers of black shirt. So you can see that in the picture here. So there's there's layering and parallel to the, so that's bedding and then parallel to the bedding are these layers these dark layers so this is chert and we'll look at this more closely it's kind of it's a little bit shiny it's made of silica and the the bottom of this unit the bottom of the kalkberg is the is the when you're coming up up the section from below the first time you see a, a continuous layer of the chert like this we're going to identify that as Kalkberg. So let's let's look go back and look at what whack, wacky stone and pack stone are. Okay. So to classify one one way of classifying carbon uh, carbonate rocks, and there's there's more than one way, um, but a simple way we'll use in the field is basically using the proportion of coarse fossiliferous material versus muddy stuff. So if, if the rock is entirely composed of just chunks of little fossils, broken pieces, like basically like a sand, sandstone almost, but made out of, out of carbonate and um, fossil pieces, we call it a grain stone. So this, this lacks mud. So the grain, the individual little chunks that you can see with your with your eye are are touching each other and not supported by any any mud in between them so if it's very similar to that but there's actually enough mud in there um, which is really fine grain stuff um, we call that a pack stone so it's still it's still grain supported so it's basically you know the, the large the large grains are holding the stuff together, but it's filled with a muddy matrix. We call that a pack stone. If it's basically mud with just some fossils in it, we call it either a mudstone if there's just less than 10% on bigger grains, and a wacky stone if there's more than 10%. So we'll see examples of all, all of these four kinds, and this is kind of the main um, identification tool we'll use uh, or one of the main ones we'll use to describe carbonates. So the Kalkberg, it says, is um, a, a wacky stone or a pack stone. So it's kind of intermediate. It's got a fair amount of fossils, but it's not totally grain supported and it's not just like fossil, basically fossil free. Okay, the next unit is the New Scotland. So this is also Devonian in NS for New Scotland. So this one also has fossils, um, particularly brachiopods and bryozoa, but they're interbedded. That means they're mixed with, argillicious just means like a sort of non, like mud, uh, silicious mud, not calcareous mud. So argillicious buff gray weathering lime wacky stones and limey dark gray mudstones. So this just means um, there's a grayish color wacky stone. So let's go back here. So that's sort of pretty muddy, but fair amount of fossils. It also has argillicious, so it has some clay in it that's that's not um, limestone. And it also has layers of limey dark gray mudstones. So if you can see in the photograph, there's like dark layers. Those are going to be those are the mudstones. So those are muddier, and then between them are the are layers of the of the um, limestone. So New Scotland beds are generally more argillicious than the Kalkberg beds. So there's there's more, they're less pure a carbonate. And we'll bring along 
hydrochloric acid is diluted, so it's not it's not dangerous. Um, you can put a drop of that on to um, the rocks, and if it if it bubbles and fizzes, that means it's um, a limestone. If it doesn't, it's um, either a mudstone or it's possibly a dolomite. The lower portions of the New Scotland have a distinctive interval composed of alternating dark gray and light rusty tan weathering beds that are 15 to 25 centimeters thick. So over here we have DK, Kalkberg, and then, we, and then when we get into these layer, these alternating layers, we call that the New Scotland. The New Scotland can contain chert, just like the Kalkberg, but um, once you get into these alternating layers, we call it New Scotland. So the next unit we're going to look at here, and, and these units are really in no particular order, is the Manlius. Um, so the, there's a pencil here for scale. Um, I'm going to send out the PowerPoint that has these kind of long descriptions that kind of go into a little bit more detail than you really need. Um, but what is really distinctive of the Manlius formation is uh, it's there's there's very few fossils, um, so it's like a muddy source. And the I'll zoom in here on this picture. The so here's this pencil for scale. Um, so there's there's some layers that have a very thin like sort of like sheets of paper almost kind of thickness of of layering. You can see them on the weathered face here. So this this face kind of broke off at some point recently, but this but it weathers. Um, you can see kind of a, the roads dissolve in a little bit more in different layers. So the Manlius has this like paper thin layering. That's pretty, that's really distinctive. Next to the Manlius is the Quimans formation. Um, so this is a grain stone or pack stone. Um, again, so that's going to have quite a bit of fossil material. And this one has a really distinct fossil that you can you can usually find if you look carefully. So this is what it looks like. It's a shell, but if you look at it in if, in cross section, it's kind of it's got this kind of beak, um, this this pointy triangle coming out. You can see it. There's one. There's another one. Here's another one. There's one there, one there, one there. So sometimes this is a, this one has kind of maybe the, this is the best picture I have of it. Um, but if you can find a fossil that that shows that beak pretty clearly, then you know you're in the Quimans. It's the only unit that has these fossils. So that's a pretty distinct way of identifying the Quimans. Okay, another unit we're going to see. Um, so all these, all the units we looked at so far are um, carbonates. They're limestone. So with your acid bottle that we'll hand out on the trip, you can put a drop on those, and they'll usually fizz. You should, you should um, generally as a, you should generally have a fresh surface. So you take a piece of the rock. You crack it open, you get a fresh surface, um, and that's what you want to do your your test of to find out if it's limestone or not. So the Austin Glen is a is a rock that will not fizz particularly. It is a mudstone, and alternating with the sandstone. So here you can see this is somebody's hat for scale. Um, there's thinner layers that have that are, are muddy. And then these thicker layers are sands, and they tend to alternate. So there'll be, here's here's some more muddy layer, sandy layer, muddy layer, sandy layer, some muddier. Um, 
and you're not going to find fossils in here. This was deposited in a deep marine environment. Here's another image. Um, so over here we have um, one of the carbonate units, and then here is muddy layers of the of the Austin Glen, sandy layers, muddy layers. You can see some sandy layers there. The, the muddy layers are really crumbly. This unit um, does not, uh, it's not very strong. It doesn't form cliffs. It tends to erode pretty quickly, mostly because of that fairly weak and crumbly mudstone. All right, and we saw that. That's the Queeman's fossil again. Okay, so um, we can understand the sequence of rocks that we're going to see um, as a um, and there's there's sedimental sedimental logical environment. Okay, so these are the limestones tend to form in, in pretty shallow water, and uh, reef kind of a reef environment. So reef environments have um, a shoal, which is kind of the active reef, and then sort of a, a tidal area near the shore, and and then a, a lagoon between the, the reef and the, and the shore. So the, uh, where the waves are, are fairly shallow by the shore and at the reef, the, um, it's a higher en high energy environment. So the, the, there's, there's strong currents, um, fine grain material, mud is not gonna settle out um, typically um, at the shore or at the shoal. So the manlius, which was that muddy, um, very fine grain laminated um, unit, the one that looks like this, so it's got, it's basically all mud. Um, that, that forms in the lagoon environment. The quimans, which was the, um, this guy, which has, if you look at, you can see these big fossils, but there's also a lot of this, this stuff is just kind of sand sized grains, chunks of fossils. So that's a high energy um, sedimentary rock that forms in the shoal area. And then the Kalkberg in New Scotland, you're getting progressively deeper. Um, and coarse grains will come off of the off of the um, shoal to form the Kalkberg. So let's just go back to the Kalkberg for a second. Um, right here we are. So it says the Kalkberg um, wacky stone and pack stone. So wacky stone and pack stone. So still quite a bit of um, coarse grain in the Kalkberg. And then remember when you get to the New Scotland. The New Scotland has these alternating layers um, of, of basically mud. So that that's the kind of thing that you know maybe in a, maybe a storm kind of causes the sort of mud to be carried in the water, and it and it if you get far enough from the shore, it, there's low enough energy that it'll it'll fall out, and you get these alternating layers of of carbonate and, and mud. And this, the sequence that we find, the, the, the order, the age order of these goes um, from the bottom to the top, Manlius, Queemans, Kalkberg, New Scotland. So the, the rock sequence we're looking at is recording uh, a sea level rise basically or a relative sea level rise so the first thing we see is kind of the the near shore stuff and then further and further shore so the place place where at the water was getting deeper and this this environment that we're seeing was migrating
Okay, so we'll talk more about this kind of thing, but I just want to give you an introduction to the um, stratigraphy that we'll be looking at. And we'll definitely, we'll be going over this again. In the, um, the first day on Friday, the field trip, we, we look at each of these rocks one by one and talk about their sort of defining characteristics so that you can map them out when you see them later on. So when you're in the field, you're going to have this information with you. I'll put this on Blackboard and also print out a copy for you. So this is the essential information that you need to recognize and identify the, the different layers. So we're going to have four different layers, four different colors. Um, should give it in parentheses here. So the, the oldest layer is the Austin Glen, which is the alternating shale and, and sandstone. The column here gives the roughly the thickness in the area, and then something about the sediment, sedimentological or the tectonic environment. Above the Austin Glen, um, we'll find the, the Manlius, and there's another another unit called the roundout that we're not going to worry about. It's generally a meter thick or less. And what's really important here is that I've I put in bold the base. So it's as we as we walk up the section from from one lock layer into the next, we need to know okay what how do we define the boundary between the different layers? So the base of the Manlius is is the first carbonate beds above the unconformity here. So there's carbonates overlaying the shales. So those we're going to call, we're going to call them orange, call them Manlius. Manlius has those um, finely laminated layers. The last time we see those, um, we're, we've entered into the Queemans formation. So the base of the Queemans is the last finely laminated um, Manlius formation. This also has this distinctive fossil. This is the one fossil that you need to try to look for and remember. And above that, we have the, the Kalkberg, which has this lowest, it has these continuous chert layers. So the first time we come to the to a planar um, chert, not just a sort of clump of chert, um, but an actual layer that goes on for more than a foot or two, that that's going to be the Kalkberg, and we're going to lump the Kalkberg and the New Scotland in as one unit and color it blue. So there's only four units, um, pretty distinctive um, differences between them. And we also have on here the the description of you know what a mudstone, a wacky stone, pack stone, and graystone is. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the sort of safety um, issues. So one of the plants, there's, there's a couple things we got to be careful for. One of them is poison ivy. So. Um, this time of the year, so this is this is a photograph before um, when it was rather cold. We're going to be probably seeing this stuff um, sprouting with little leaves. So leaves of three, let it be. So poison ivy has three leaves. Um, when it's young, when it's buds like this, it can be kind of a red color. Um, the the poison ivy vines have these kind of furry kind of tentacles on them. You can see some black chert here as well. So these are all poison ivy vines. You don't want to touch the vines. You don't want to touch the, the poison ivy um, plant itself. Here's a close up of those poison ivy vines that we want to avoid. Okay, so here's um, 
probably by the time we're we're in the field, it'll be poison ivy will be looking kind of like this. So generally, it's green. Um, notice that there's a little it's a little bit reddish in the in the middle of the leaves where the where the three leaves split off. The leaves can kind of be have this sort of you know these separate points. Sometimes it can be a little bit a little bit sort of oily looking, a little shiny. This is a pretty typical looking patch of poison ivy. It's got the red, red centers of the leaves. And here's another example where it's kind of a more shiny finish. So if you touch the poison ivy, um, usually in a day to two, day or two, you'll get a, a rash. Um, it won't it won't happen right away. Um, and what but but one thing that we can do I'll bring along um, there's a there's a product um, I forget exactly the name of it but it if you if you rub it on it it removes the oil and you've got I don't know eight hours be, be after you've been exposed that you can rub this stuff on maybe not eight the sooner the better. Um, so basically, we can, you know, if you if you did touch it, we'll 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 put this stuff on you, and then you rinse it off, and you'll probably be fine. Um, the the rash, if you do get it, can last for a few weeks. So it's pretty it's pretty unpleasant. You want to avoid it, but it's not life threatening. The other. Um, thing that we want to be careful about is deer ticks. So there's definitely um, ticks in the area. Um, so these are a problem because they can transmit diseases. Although I think it's actually pretty rare. I think I think I read only like I don't know, something like one to five percent of the ticks has Lyme disease. And it and the tick needs to be in you for I think at least 24 hours before it is capable of transmitting Lyme disease. So um, the the main thing here is to check yourself for ticks um, every night. You can also bring um, a bugs bug repellent. That's a very good idea. Um, so they don't get on you in the first place. Another strategy that that is fairly effective is to wear light colored clothes because the ticks are dark. Um, you can tuck your pants into your socks and that means that way that the ticks only climb up. So you've got all this time from when they start climbing, um, they climb pretty slowly that you might happen or one of your classmates might notice, oh, there's a tick climbing up your pants. Um, so if your if your pants are in your socks and your shirt's tucked into your pants, then they gotta climb all the way up to your neck. So there's there's that takes quite a while. Um, usually one or two students um, will get a tick. Um, when we can just pull it out, it's not a big deal. Um, and. Yeah, so the main thing is to, to, to check for them. So you, you can, they can be pretty small, but usually you can feel them. And if you, so if you rub your, if you use your hand to kind of run it over your, over your skin um, before in, in the evening, after you've been out, um, you usually will find, if you have one, you usually find it. You want to kind of scratch your, around in your hair because um, they'll sometimes be, they'll get in your hair. So these are a real, real annoyance. Um, fortunately, you know, like I said, you know, definitely gone up there and like no students have gotten them at all. Usually just one or two um, will actually get one of these things. So and nobody's ever gotten uh, Lyme disease on one of our trips yet. So 
we'll um, we'll also talk about this again when we're out in the field. So those are unfortunately things that that we have to look out for, but um, not a not really a big deal. We can there's nothing no reason that we can't go have a good time. You just need to check for you know take some precautions, be on the lookout for these things, and you know check check yourselves um, in the evening. So the next lecture is going to cover um, sort of the east, the bigger picture of East Coast tectonics that um, kind of gives the background of the area that we'll be seeing and, and the large area, including New York City. <laughs>